it's also important to remember that Grace Lee Boggs told us, she's an American revolutionary um, and philosopher. She said that a revolution must be an evolution. We have to actually become more human with each other because if it's just a revolution, then the same systems of power repeat themselves. This is Crisis Cast 2020 with me, Toby Goodman, a podcast where I get timely wisdom from experts in life and business. These guests will answer my five questions, sharing wisdom and insights to help you and me get through this global shitstorm. Today on Crisis Cast 2020, Abigail Rose Clark. I connected with health behavior expert Abigail through Lena West, episode 17, and I immediately knew she would give me a unique perspective from her home in Mexico, because until now, I hadn't spoken with anyone in Mexico. Now, it's normal that I'd ask guests to close windows for sound quality reasons, but in this case, I wasn't able to because Abigail has no windows where she lives. So... All the pleasant animal sounds in this show are real, and of course, none of them were harmed, as far as I know, in the making of this podcast. In this conversation, I speak with Abigail about COVID-19, global protests, history, pleasure, and her work helping people have a better relationship with their bodies through her embodied life method. All fascinating stuff. Enjoy. Before we start the show, I have something for you if you identify as pod curious. It's perfect for you if you're an expert, consultant or business owner. Maybe you're wondering if podcasting is worth the effort, especially now, or perhaps you've tried podcasting in the past but have been disappointed with the results. In this free guide, Podstar, I'll share the exact seven steps we use to help publish over 2,000 podcasts each month. To get instant access, go to podcastnetworksolutions.com. Abigail Rose Clark, welcome to Crisis Cast. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure. So this is the first time I've started a podcast where someone said, hey, listen, I'm in an open air house in a jungle, so you might hear some bird sounds. So where are you? Uh, I'm in a a small village on the coast of central Mexico. And yeah, it's just, that is exactly the story. I live in a house that's very open and there's a flock of parrots that live nearby. And so they like to make themselves known. <laughs> cool. So this will be um, unedited parrot noise throughout because um, there's no glass. Like I can see in the video, there's literally no glass in that window at all. So exactly. Yeah, it looks awesome. <laughs> they haven't flown through the house yet, but we'll see. There's a first for everything. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay, so what's been your experience in Mexico of of the pandemic so far? I'm really interested in in what's going on in South America. There seems to be, yeah, a few, a few different versions yeah. of what's going on coming through the UK media. Tell me what's going on. Yeah, well, I can't speak for all of Mexico. Obviously, I'm in a very small uh, part of it, but um, you know, it's been. It's been interesting when you consider that, you know, we have to consider sort of the the economic situation and the global history that has led us to economic situations such as this. So the, the, the global sort of uh, systems have made it so that Mexico is very dependent on tourism. Tourism is the primary industry in Mexico. So to have tourism shut down on a global level, basically like not exactly overnight, but it, it kind of was overnight, has made this um, quite drastic. So I feel very fortunate that where I am, um, you know, it, it hasn't hit as hard as in other places, but it has definitely hit. And now there's this, the, the reopening has begun um, so that, you know, and, and there's, there's hope and also, of course, precautions being taken. But, um, you know, being not from here, of course, my I don't have the same kind of depth of an awareness of the understanding as someone who, who would be native to Mexico. But uh, I would say that the it has hit economically in a way that um, that is to be expected when you see when you consider how much Mexico has kind of had to rely on tourism from other countries. Yeah, I was chatting to a client the other day who actually cancelled her beach holiday in Mexico, right? Because of it, right? So, and I I hadn't really. Th- thought of Mexico as that kind of place but 
I started looking at those holidays and I was like, oh yeah, that looks great. I mean, it's an amazing, now that it's reopening, it's like, it's an amazing place. I would say that if you can, if, if you're needing a, a you know, if you're needing a, a, a release from all the stress and you're healthy, by all means, <laughs> come wash your hands, wear your face mask, and then like enjoy the, the beauty that this country offers. Um, but yeah, it has been, it has been a, a difficult ride for sure. So then tell me, you're originally from Massachusetts? Yeah, in, in New England, in the, in the United States. Mm -hmm. Tell me on a personal level what's going on with that, because it sounds like you needed to make a choice at one point that you were going to be in Mexico for this moment in time. So how's, how are things affecting you on a personal level? Well, it was a difficult choice, but um, I divide my time between the States and, and Mexico. And when I'm in the States, I am uh, with my mom. And so who's, you know, older and very good health and luckily is, has managed, has gone through this in a very healthy, strong way. But it, it became really clear that to leave a place where things were, were, you know, for the most part, good and go to a place where things are, you know, for the most part, there's been cases, but it's not, you know, it's not one of the hot spots. Um, but to, to travel from here to there through the airports was not a wise choice, right? Because it'd be like basically going through the most likely place to, to catch it. Um, so we made the choice, her and I together, that it would make more sense for me to stay here. Um, and so, you know, all I know from about what's going on there is what I'm hearing from her. But, you know, she's, she says that now it's just become kind of second nature to wear her mask and carry her disinfectant wipes. And she goes to the grocery store once, once every three weeks. And she's got her sort of her pod of people that, um, that take care of her. She's in a rural, uh, that take care of each other. She's in a rural area. And I do know that that's, that's helping people. That's to be in places where there's less population is a, a safer way to be. Yeah. hundred percent. So what about in, in Mexico? I mean, you've, you've obviously spent time there before, but not under these conditions. So how, how's that affected? How's that affected your life? I, I wonder, you know, what you've been doing, have you been doing things differently? Have you been reading more, walking more, like have your habits changed or are you kind of totally cool with where you are and you're there for that reason anyway? Well, I live in a, in a place with no cars, so we walk all the time. <laughs> um, and you know, it's, it, it is, it has made differences for sure. And like I said, there's, there's still, even as we are now are sort of, you know, when you and I made this, this, uh, date to talk, it, the thing about time right now is it's changing so rapidly is that three weeks ago feels like three years ago. And so it's even starting to shift a bit, you know, now beaches are open again, more uh, tourism is, is reopening. Um, but yeah, of course it's changed things. Of course, of course. I mean, people didn't used to walk around with face masks on. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, I don't think it's, I can't relate this experience to the experience of someone li living in a densely populated city. I don't even know. I haven't been to Mexico city since this started. So I can't even speak it wouldn't be fair of me to speak to what it's like in, in the more densely populated cities. Um, but that's again, a, a benefit of privilege and a benefit and an honor of, of being in a space that's, that's so full of nature is that it doesn't have to change. It didn't change as much as it does in cities, for example. Oh, there definitely were changes. So tell me about your work. Tell me about embodied life mess method and, um, how are you helping your clients right now? Because I imagine there's quite a lot of... That has been... I mean, our, our, my work hasn't changed, but there has definitely been a shift in the necessity or the perceived necessity. I think we. my work focuses on the body's role in social change, meaning that to me, um, we can't have a change of, of social systems, meaning... And by that, I mean, essentially all the oppressive systems, systems like racism and, uh, and sexism and classism, ableism, uh, homophobia, etc. We can't have a change of those systems without also having a change in how we are, how we inhabit our bodies. And there's for two major reasons. One is that, um, 
these systems live in us. We're uh, indoctrinated into them in various different ways. And so if we approach it just from a mental level, we're actually not going to get to the more subconscious level, right? Like it's very, it, for you and I are both white. It's uh, for, to, to consciously say, I'm not racist is one level. To, but then they've done study after study after study that subconsciously white people will respond to images of black people in a, associating them more likely with violence, with, with danger, et cetera. That's a subconscious level. And it, you don't get to the subconscious just through a mental, men, just, through, just through talking and just through ideas. You have to live into that. So there's that. And then also understanding that, that the culture influences our body. Right. It influences how we inhabit our body, how our bodies um, respond to stress, how our bodies respond to pleasure, how our bodies relate to one another. So understanding that the culture influences our bodies means that then we have a hope of understanding how our bodies can influence the culture. Meaning if I change how I inhabit my body through awareness, through uh, deep acceptance, then when I approach a relationship with someone, be it this conversation that we're having, which is a form of relating to each other, or more intimate relationships, then I have uh, I have different um, opportunities available than if I'm just kind of going on the systems. Like right now, I'm from the United States, so I'm well, I'm not in the protests in physical form. I'm paying close attention to all of these protests that are happening uh, against the police. But right now, on a global level, there's over a hundred protests happening um, throughout the world. 30 government leaders and, go and governments have fallen or have been significantly changed through global protests since June 1st alone. Eight of the 12 South, uh, South American countries are in are experiencing significant protests. And many of these protests are, are related to the, uh, to the authoritarian uh, forms of, of control, right? Of which po policing is one. So... Right now, my work includes helping people understand that when we're talking about, for example, defunding the police, it's not like all of a sudden now everything's just going to go into pure lawlessness. It's like understanding that there's a way to relate to each other that does not include domination and control. And when we can, when we switch how we relate to each other in a way that doesn't include, that doesn't focus on domination and control from the most benign, the most intimate, the most casual relationships and then outward, then policing doesn't take the same space. It doesn't have the same need. So my work, this is a long answer I recognize to your question, but my work has kind of over the past few months from the start of the quarantines until now, it's encompassing all of this in very direct ways. It's like, all right, well, how do we navigate this rapid shift from having all these things to do, right? These lives that are so busy to all of a sudden it's like, nope, you're just going to stay here. There's a there's a lot that happens there. How are we going to navigate this shift onto relation, the shift of relationships? And now how are we going to navigate this r drastic, global, radical change of culture and these shifts of, of governments? Um, so, yeah, I approach that from a lens of what the body has to share. That's, that's pretty incredible. <laughs> Tell me that stat again. Like, that's an incredible stat. Uh, government since June the 1st. Yeah, this comes from, um, I should have pulled it up so I could tell you, I think it's the Carnegie Institution International. Let me, let me, let me pull it up so I don't mispronounce the place I got the stats from. Yeah. Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. So they have a, they have a website. I'll send you the link so that you can put it in the show notes. They have a website that tracks the like global protests, significant global protests. And I was looking at it just early this morning over a hundred goal protests. I have it on the map. It's like the whole globe is lit up with protests happening. And then, yeah, that the piece where there over 30 leaders and governments have had to have had to radically shift due to these protests, that eight of the 12 South American countries are protesting. I was just like, you know, I think that there's, you're from the UK, I'm from the US. The UK and the US tends to pull the global attention, especially the US, like I'll take that. America, America supersizes everything, including its own importance. So the American sort of like role in this make, could make one feel as though this is an American protest, but it is not. This is a, a global moment of uprising, right? So we're in, t we're in, we are in a time right now that descendants will be talking about. 
right? For all the various reasons for what happened in 2020 with, with the coronavirus and also what happened in 2020 with this massive global uprising. Like we are in a, we are in a marked moment of history right now of the, of the global story. Yeah, ab- absolutely. We're seeing, uh, we're seeing history being rewritten for sure in in the UK from from the experiences that that I'm observing. Maybe not having so much because um, I'm not I'm not out on the road for various reasons doing it. It's definitely changing what's happening here and how how I think things will be taught going forward. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's being communicated on an educational level about how to teach, what to teach, what to include. Absolutely, absolutely. Education is transformed. Yeah, it's just so interesting that these two things are happening at the same time, right? It's yeah. Crazy. It is. It is it is a, a marked moment. And I think that, you know, you said like, you know, that you're not out on the streets. I'm not either. I want to be I want I've been thinking a lot about that because there's a part of me that's just like, wow, you know, like it's hard to not be out on the streets. And without without being careful not to imply that it's an excuse for not going when you can go. It's also important to remember that Grace Lee Boggs told us, um, and I, I like to use the present tense for her, even though she passed several years ago, because I feel like she's so alive and well. She's an American revolutionary um, and philosopher. She said that an, a revolution must be an evolution. We have to actually become more human with each other, because if it's just a revolution, then the same systems of power repeat themselves. Do you ever read George Orwell's book, Animal Farm? It was on a like, required reading list for me in high school. Well, in that story, there's a revolt, there's a revolution, and then what happens? The pigs, George Orwell was being very clear with that, with that allegory, the pigs then just become another form of the same systems that the animals had revolted against in the beginning, right? Because there wasn't enough of an evolution. So right now, as we're in this moment of revolution, of change, of uprising, every single type of action is necessary for that same, for the, the, the collective evolution. So you're a storyteller. That's what podcasts do, right? They tell, they tell stories, they gather stories from others, they share stories, they share stories in various different ways. So we've got to be aware of what stories we're telling. Are we telling stories that fit into the old, the old format and this sort of this weird idea that people have of let's return back to normal. What? It's like, let's get to, when things get back to normal, it's like, what? <laughs> What's the real version of normal were you living in? Cause it wasn't, nothing was normal back then, but it was just like for some people more comfortable. Or are we telling stories that, that further the evolution that, that guide us into the ways in which when our descendants are talking about this incredible sea change year 2020, they're like, and that's when things changed. And this is when we started having different kinds of relationships. This is when we started having different kinds of, of relationships, not just with other humans, but with the world around us, with the natural world, with, the, with culture at large. This is when things changed. How are they changing? Right? How are they shifting away from control and domination and supremacy of all forms, including, and most importantly, white supremacy? How are they changing in all forms? to then now come into more to a balance, right? So it's like the revolution that needs all action to put it just on the streets is to, is to uh, limit the far reaching, uh, the far reaching need that we have to create an entirely different culture. The streets are important. I want to like give a huge shout outs to everyone who's putting their bodies on the actual streets. Like this is so essential and it is making the change possible. And the streets need, the streets are, are made up of more than just the streets, right? The action that we're seeing in the streets is not just the streets. So, so if you can't be in the streets for whatever reason, you're still part of the, of the, of the evolution revolution, right? You're still part of it. And tell me once again, the name of the lady. Grace Lee Boggs. She was a Chinese American, um, lived in Detroit, lived to be a hundred, uh, and just a phenomenal philosopher. Uh, on all things revolution. Really phenomenal. For a while, I don't know if it's still on Netflix, but she had a, there was a documentary called American Revolutionary about her life. But she's written a number of books, just one of the most brilliant thought leaders in the past, I think, I think like five years ago when she was 100 years old. But I, 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 like I said, I still, have, I still feel like I want to talk about her in present tense because she's just so here. 
Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we have to start within, we have to start from within. We have to start with our own body. Uh, and we're all locked at home in a slightly different routine, perhaps, than we had before this all started. Um, where, where would one start with that? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think that a place to start is with our, our personal de definition and, and sort of uh, experience of pleasure. By which I mean pleasure through capitalism has been a pleasure focused on accumulation, right? Or on, on, on consuming, right? So I feel pleasure when I'm consuming something or accumulating something. But to go to the body in terms of pleasure means that means slowing down enough to actually feel what it is that we're feeling as we feel it and to be in a conversation with the body about what the body wants right now. Right? So it's like, okay, if I am just in my mind and thinking about thinking about how I have to control the body, this is a conversation like I, I, well, I'll just say it. Like there's all this talk about like the COVID-15 nonsense, fat shaming nonsense about how, you know, like, oh, you shouldn't like gain, I guess it would be kilos in, <laughs> in the UK. But this like this feeling that like this fear everyone has about gaining weight, fear that people have in this, you know, in, in the privileged countries where, my God, what a privilege to gain weight during a pandemic, right? Like what a, what a, what a privilege of class. But it's like, instead of feeling like, oh, I shouldn't eat this because I'll gain weight or I should do exercise because then I'll, I'll be in better shape or, oh, I'm, so, I'm, I'm such a bad person because I did this or I'm such a lazy such and such because I did this. It's slowing down enough to be, to enter into a relationship with the body to be like, okay, what, what would make the body feel good right now? A nap, a bath, a really long exhale putting on some lotion and just like taking some time with actually like touching my own skin. Since many people, if you live alone, you're having a lack of touch that we haven't experienced in our lived lifetimes, right? What kind of, maybe a glass of water, like actually feeling how the water feels going into your body can be a sensation of pleasure. Maybe making a colorful meal that has just, you know, an abundance of colors and sitting and actually smelling, tasting, touching the food surrounding yourself with beauty in whatever way that you can, or even just looking out the, if you can't go outside, looking out the window at the natural world, these moments of pleasure, we've been taught to think that pleasure is, uh, is unnecessary, right? That the production is what matters. If we're not producing, then what business do we have feeling pleasure? But instead to re-enter into a conversation with the body to really be curious about what what would offer pleasure because that soothes right that soothes us and when we're soothed we actually go into a different part of the autonomic nervous system the parasympathetic nervous system that allows us to relate to each other more and it allows us to take a wider lens on the world around us and have more creative solutions when we are not in a state of pleasure when we're in a state of stress and go, 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 and I have to get this done before, you know, before I can talk to you because I have like, you know, X, Y, and Z left to do. We actually go into a hyperactivated sympathetic nervous system state, which l completely limits, if not takes away our ability to have to take, make creative, take creative solutions. There's a lot to go into about that on like vagal tone and the nervous system stuff. This is like, this is why I work with people over the course of long stretches so that it doesn't feel like an anatomy lecture. But the most simple stuff is that take pleasure and notice how this gives you more a, a capacity to be creative in how you approach the world. And that's what we need, right? That's what we need. We need more creative solutions. We can't do things how we've been doing them. They didn't work. They got us to a very broken place. So how can we be creative moving forward? So by all means, take a nap, take a bath, put on your favorite soft clothes, like do something that actually gives you pleasure and know that that is, is necessary work. Yeah, right. This is reminding me of uh, the closest conversation I've had to this since I started this podcast was with a um, lady called Katrina Mullen whose podcast is up so that if if this is kind of the kind of thing that you're enjoying the kind of information you're looking at then this is that is another show to listen to and abigail if you haven't heard that then yeah I'll, I'll go to i'll go listen to it that sounds great i mean obviously it's up my alley 
<laughs> it's right. It it right up your alley. Repeat her name again. What was her name? Katrina Mullin. Katrina Mullin. Ah, uh, don't know what the episode number is, but um, relatively recent. She's in the Netherlands, but she's German, and she works okay, in cool. um, mindfulness and leadership and stuff. So yeah, this kind of feels like a similar a similar conversation um, in a very cool way. Um, so awesome. So tell me, you know, ideally they lift the lockdown, you can freely go back and see your mom and still go back to where you are now. What does the other side look like for you in in a good, positive way? What are you hoping to get get from all this disruption? Oh, okay, that's a great question. So I think, you know, it, it goes with what I was saying earlier about this, um, this recognition that we are in a moment that descendants will be talking about. So that's where I've been putting a lot of thought and physical energy is just what would I want? You know, I don't have children, but, um, but like, what would I want my, my neighbor's daughter is three years old. What would I want her grandchildren talking about in this moment and based on that how should my actions change now right like what kind of um uh the the word is coming to me in spanish sanación like healing is necessary for her grandchildren to be speaking about this time with a sense of reverence and gratitude rather than with a sense of dread and anger and and just like, you know, wow, we've really had to be healing so much because of what they did at this moment, right? Instead to be talking about like, wow, our great grandparents took action, like made different choices. So that's what I, you know, I hope I I hope that the disruption in the status quo of just the, you know, constant consuming of this constant sort of just doing the things that have to be done because they've always had to be done. I hope that that stays with us. And it does appear like it is because we're having this moment where people are rising all over the world and saying, no, enough is enough. We don't want the way that it's been. We were at, we completely reject it. And so even, even in the face of danger, where it's like people are gathering in the streets in during a pandemic and the glo- and the mainstream media would have you think that people are stupid for doing that. But no, that, that means people are committed. It's like, even the fear of getting this, of getting this disease isn't enough to stop me from standing up, from not standing up, from rising to what the, what this moment calls for. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's what I hope for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's a lovely, for me, a lovely lens to look through, you know, how do we need to, what do we need to do to make sure that our children and their children look back on this time as, as a good thing because there are lots of good things happening at home here. You know, we're okay. We're fine. We, you know, really we've got abundance of food delivery options and, and, you know, a roof over our head and all of the stuff that we could possibly ever need from a consumer point of view. Are you talking about yourself or about like the, the UK in general? I'm talking about myself. Uh, uh-huh. I would I wouldn't talk about uh yeah I I wouldn't say that's necessarily true for everyone in the UK because it certainly isn't mm-hmm. um but for me we're 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 in a really luck, lucky situation so the concern then moves towards how my kids are framing it like and they're young they're 3 and 6 the 3 year old mm-hmm. probably won't remember this as well but the 6 year old is massively affected by it and so the mission is to make sure that yeah he's of course he's affected by it. there's nothing i can do about that but it's how he's affected by it and the conversations that we're able to have that he doesn't get to have with teachers or with his peers because he's he's locked at home you know so um what work do i need to do as a parent to make sure that when we talk about what happened last year and the year before that and you know as time moves on that he goes oh yeah that was that was cool or you know I think really though, I mean, the three-year-old might have not have conscious memories of it, but three-year-olds are definitely, they're, they're recording, right? Like they're getting, a, you know, a deep, they're sponges. And I think that it's, you know, like I said, I don't have my own, my own children, but I do live so close that I spend a lot of time with my neighbor's three-year-old and it's, I could, she, you know, she's three, like your youngest. 
talking to a three-year-old about, you know, like the rational reasons and all these cause and effect stuff, like that's not going to land. But she, I mean, that's the kind of the joke about three-year-olds, right? They, they mimic so much. And it's like, when we go out into the garden and water the garden, like she's, you know, she picks up on just everything that we're doing. And then she remembers it and she comes back a few weeks later and she's just like in the same, in the same thing. And so any way that we can as adults be showing an example of what it means to be putting the healing at the focus and the, and the reimagining relationships as the focus that goes beyond any kind of like sit down and like, let me, let me tell you a story about how things should be. It's more like those stories only really take root when they're being, um, when they're being also lived through us. Like how are the adults around the children living? And in a way it's like, I understand that for parents, it's been really hard to have children to realize that schools help out a lot, you know, by having the children, but also it's, it's also been this opportunity to really, you know, pull back and question like, well, what are children learning in schools? A lot of times the public schools, they're more interested in indoctrination than they are in actually education. Sit for this many hours a day, raise your hand when you need to go to the bathroom. Don't talk back, be quiet, answer these multiple choice questions. And there you go. Rather than like questioning, being creative, et cetera. Yeah. So hundred mm-hmm. percent. Right. That reminds me of the Seth Godin stuff that he talks about, you know, the education system is completely broken and that, you know, you go in and you're told to do these things and you're told to look the same, dress the same in the, in the UK, you know, you do have to wear mm-hmm. a uniform, uniform at school and don't stand out because, you know, don't embarrass yourself. Don't, uh, mm-hmm. don't make an example of yourself. And yet mm-hmm. you leave into the real world. And the option is to, you know, be, be a sheep and join a, you know, you will get a job and you will do, you know, get on the wheel and then you'll probably get depression because, you know, like, or turns out that if you want to do something, you have to take a risk and you have to learn how to stand out and you have to learn how to, however that manifests itself, whether it's dressing differently or speaking up for something you believe it's, it's a completely different set of behaviors that you're going to have to learn if in my opinion and i'll say it because it's my podcast you know if you want if you want peace and if you want to stand out and 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 do something that makes you happy you know i don't think it is really the education system here is certainly still trying to get you to broadly blend in absolutely absolutely yeah i actually i te- i volunteer as an english teacher in the in the middle school here and just yesterday I was talking with one of my former students about you know just what she found to be not to be lacking and not working in her education which you know one of the most like intelligent strong like just just incredible uh people and was left feeling like she wasn't smart like she wasn't you know like just until she went out into the world and was able to, to experience her own intelligence and creativity again. And it's like, that's, that's not okay. Like, I I just like refuse to, to believe that that's what our, that's all we're capable of as humans is like leaving incredibly bright, creative beings feeling like they have to be quiet, check the right box, you know, look the same, like you were saying, talk the same, act the same. And that's the only path to prosperity, to happiness, to safety, nonsense, absolute nonsense. And then, and one of the gifts of the Corona crisis is that everyone saw how much nonsense that is. It's like, if you have spent all of your time working to get the house and the car and the safe job with the 401k, et cetera. I mean, it's like, yes, absolutely. There's some systems in place that you might not be like, you know, you have food and a, and a house and et cetera. Whereas people who do not, do not. And also how many people lost their job literally overnight? It's like, this is nonsense. You're sacrificing so much to, for this false illusion, for this illusion of of safety. And now all of a sudden it's like the world woke up and was like, oh, right. This actually isn't safe at all. Right. And I'm just miserable thinking that this makes me safe. Yeah. I've always felt it's been more risky to have a job than to row your own boat. Well, I mean, here we are, right? You're, you have your own podcast. I'm an entrepreneur. You interview entrepreneurs. I think, you know, (laughs) 
right. you're around like-minded people. Right. Yeah, interesting. So the so the whole thing has been designed around the industrial revolution, and it, it it's about fa- It's about the fact that people needed to learn facts to do things. But now we have Google, so we don't need to learn facts. You know, we can do other stuff. But there's is that whole conversation. Well, except that I mean, I think. Well, the thing too is that like people have been told to learn a certain version of history. Right. What we do need to do is learn how to question versions of history. Right. It's like so the this I this this move towards multiple choice tests. Is that a has that been a big move in the UK too? It's been a huge move in the US and then also here in Mexico. Has that been a is that like primarily how people do not that I've seen, but that might be just because my children are a little bit younger. Oh okay. I haven't yeah, right. not that I've seen. So it's a huge, it's been a huge push. You know, I got out of the school system just before that, that push started in the States, but then teaching here, it's like, it's all multiple choice. This gives you the sense that there's one right answer. Often here, they're, they're not even the correct answer, but that's, a, that's another story for another day. But it's like, it doesn't leave room for, for a creative response. I know for, even before that move in, in high school, when I went to public high school, the focus was always more on just essentially regurgitating, memorizing some facts, yeah, exactly some dates, that. et cetera, instead of questioning and asking, all right, well, okay, yeah, we've got facts. Who wrote the facts? Because like, as we're seeing, like, I mean, this has been one of the things that's made this, the response to this crisis so hard. People have all sorts of facts. And it's like, well, who's actually, whose facts are trustworthy? Who comes from, what comes from a credible source? It's like both the UK and the United States went through you know, this, this whole thing happening of false information being spread around the elections that led to elections going the way that they went. And it's like, as long as people are being taught that thinking and questioning is actually a problem, like you get reprimanded for quite, for talk, for quote unquote, talking back to a teacher instead of just taking the facts that are being shared, checking Wikipedia if you need to, and then going forward. And it's like, well, actually let's, let's question who's been telling the story. Right. That's a question. Who's been making the facts? <laughs> yeah, well, long time ago, I was living in Germany and I was uh, dating a, a Russian girl. Right, and and her version of what she was taught at school was markedly different to the version that I wasn't. Remember having that conversation as like a twenty-one year old, you know, thinking, "Oh, okay." Like that was the right. first time, maybe, because I was living abroad and I was hanging out with people from different countries. So I was like, "Oh." Remember that moment really well. Yeah, exactly. I remember when I was when I first started traveling and um, meeting people from El Salvador as an American, and like we didn't like their history was not what we were taught, right? It's like what America did in El Salvador in the eighties was uh, was atrocious, and that was not how I learned American history. We were always the saviors, right? So. Yeah, it's like questioning facts is an important part of uh, of this whole process. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so tell me then, uh, you know, since this has all happened, what's been impressing you the most about humans and, and what's been going down? Well, that's a beautiful question. I think a thing that has just most impressed me about humans is this, this actual desire and ability to care when you take away all the things that had people unable to care or un- feeling like they didn't have time to care meaning like getting in the car and driving the hour to, to the work but then you like you sat in front of a computer for eight hours and you had to get in the car again and then go pick up the kids and, da, 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 and then it's just like oh, i just like i mean that this is horrible but i just don't have time now all of a sudden people have time and there's a hunger for real conversations. That's something that I've seen shift since before this, since as it started. And now this hunger for justice in this way, which is like, oh, people have time to be upset, right? People have like, there's no, there's no avoiding the, the, the writing on the wall. Um, and so that's just been really uh, heartening to see that like at the core of it all, um, we might not all have, we might have a long way to go in terms of breaking down sort of ingrained, uh, you know, belief systems that keep us in, in this in this sort of system of oppress of oppressing all these oppressive systems, like this ingrained belief that men are more reliable than women. It's like it's not a conscious thought; that's a thought that gets kind of 
placed in there by constantly seeing white men in leadership positions, right? It's like, we have to go to the root of it rather than just say like, oh, of course, what, like men and women are equal. All genders are equal. It's like, no, let's actually like get to the root of it. Let's get to the unconscious. And the desire to get to the root of it is there. And I just feel so heartened by that. And it gives me a lot of hope for humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that, like that answer a lot. So um, let's close this out. Tell me what you're working on right now. Tell tell me where you can be found so people can get more um, Abigail Rose Clark in their lives because I think that that's important. <laughs> Thank you. So I uh, I have an ongoing group called Anchor Continuum where we uh, explore this what it means to be in relationship with the body, relationship with the world. Uh, it's a monthly membership, so people can join at any time and stay for the amount of time that they want. You can find that on my website, which is my name, Abigail Rose Clark. Clark with an E on the end, not like Clark Kent. Clark with an E sla uh, slash anchor. And then if people want to get a sense of who I am before deciding to work with me in that way, I host a monthly conversation, a free conversation called The Embodiment Space. The next one's coming up next week. And, um, and we go over just all sorts of conversations. I guess I say next week, I don't know when this is going live, but all of the past recordings are available on my website and you get an, an invitation to join me once a month for that. We talk about things like just spanning the whole, the whole bracket. And um, sometimes I have guests, sometimes it's just me, sometimes it's a, it's a combination. And that's a way that people can sort of get a sense of what it is I do. Um, um, from there, it's called the embodiment space, and again, that's all on my website. That's awesome. That's what um, the, the book yourself, solid coaching crew, um, call an an, an ass tiptoe, <laughs> which stands, which is a kind of strange version of uh, of what it sounds like if you say it fast. But the um, an acronym is uh, uh, it's always have something to invite people to. It's you'll always have something to invite people to. You say it fast and wrong. It sounds like us tiptoe. But, always um, have someone to invite yourself to. Or, or, always have something <laughs> to invite people to. Always have something to invite people to. Ask tiptoe. <laughs> yeah, so those are my two ask tiptoes. <laughs> yeah, all, awesome. Yeah, one, one is free. So, so one which is, is free. the one. Yeah, cool. exactly. And the one that's not free is offered on a sliding scale. Um, because I recognize that especially offering something to a global community, I don't think that offering something at one price is a fair choice anymore. So, you know, I always have the, I have the really clear, it's always been my guiding principle in this money is never the reason someone can't work with me. Like if, if you want to use it as an excuse, go ahead, but it's actually never the reason that someone, um, says that they can't work with me. So if someone's coming from a different uh, socioeconomic class or a country with a different, uh, resource pool talk to me. We'll make it work. Yeah. Right. And we had that conversation. I had that conversation with Lena West as well. Who's mm -hmm. in the same space, which is, it's just so cool that she, she's got to that point and she made that, that decision of saying like, you know, it's, you know, it, she's at the point where she's financially okay. So therefore um, she's, her mask is, is fitted uh, as, as you might say. Uh, and so she, she was ready to make that move. And that's just, it's great. It was great uh, listening to her reasoning about why she wanted to do that. And it's, yeah, again, that's a heartening thing for me mm -hmm. um, when we're surrounded by so many, um, the, the bro marketing crew uh, yeah, everywhere. Sense. So uh, cool. Okay. So uh, other than the uh, anchor continuum and the free monthly conversation, is there anything specific you're working on right now? Um, well, I've always got lots of projects, but um... Right now, uh, I am starting to work on just some, some more like long form written material, possibly becoming a book at some point on what it means to be in this process of sort of continual anchoring and dismantling are the, ones, are the words I use for it, dismantling the internalized systems of oppression while anchoring into the body and the relationship between the body and the world around us so that then something different can emerge. So I'm working on that. Um, for the witches in the group, I've got a tarot deck coming out soon called the Somatic Tarot. So that's pretty exciting. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And then I also work, I work one-on-one -on -one with, um, with companies and small organizations as well. So 
when people want to improve their communication with their staff, understand how working with people rather than against people, like domination is working against people, right? But having a, a relationship that works with people, how that improves actually the bottom line and makes a more creative and resilient team. So I do that with, with uh, small businesses and, and organizations. And I work one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with people as well. If they want to have something beyond the group experience, I offer an anchor continuum. So, awesome. Like all entrepreneurs, I've got, you know, a stove full of bubbling pots. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed thank our chat. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. And folks can also, they can, you can find me on Instagram, triple underscore Abigail dot Rose, just to make it a little bit more interesting. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. And that's we'll one way to get in touch with me. We'll link everything in the show notes. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. It's been great to talk to you. This episode of Crisis Cast 2020 was produced by me in London and Kate Astrakhan in Michigan, with artwork by Ryan Field and sound design by Lee Turner. Crisis Cast 2020 is a production from Podcast Network Solutions, a full service podcast production company who are ready to help you plan, record, produce, and promote your message with podcasting. To find out more and grab your copy of Podstar if you're feeling pod curious, visit us at podcastnetworksolutions.com. <laughs>